All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, hope you enjoyed lunch. My name is Zara Kadu. Um, I'm one of the co-organizers of the conference, as well as a student here in labor studies, and I'm also on staff. Um, I am still buzzing from this morning's panel on oral history and thinking about how we bring social movement into practice, which of course is what we're here to discuss. Um, I learned so much, and so I'm so excited to continue the conversation now when we think about political education. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce this panel. Uh, first, I want to introduce to you all Jennifer Disla, who's the current executive, current co-executive director of Leadership for Democracy and Social Justice at City College. Prior to her work at LDSJ, she has led campaigns at Detroit Action, SEIU Local One, and Healthcare for America Now. Brian Garita is a Central Committee member of Plaza Proletaria and a member of the Workers' Movement for Liberation, formerly Mexicanos Unidos. Brian is an alum of Brute College, where he studied urban development and sustainability. And we welcome back Connor Coco Tomas Reed, who is the author of the new book, New York Liberation School, Study and Movement for the People's University, and the program director of the Shape of Cities to Come Institute. They are an alumni of the CUNY Graduate Center. <laughs> Um, and then holding it down, moderating, facilitating um, is Dr. Alethea Jones. Um, Alethea is a distinguished lecturer in labor studies here at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies and directs civic engagement and leadership development at the Murphy Institute. She was uh, the leadership development director at 1199 SEIU United Healthcare Workers East, and this included the Bread and Roses partnership with Harry Belafonte. She co edited. Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, 40 Years of Movement Building with Barbara Smith from SUNY Press. Over to you, Alethea, and welcome. Thank you, Sarah. All right, welcome, welcome everyone. So we're excited to have a conversation with all of you, with each other, and I thought it would be helpful to open with a, a light definition of political education. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to uh, our distinguished panelists who will have opening statements for five or seven minutes or so, and then we'll enter into uh, a dialogue. So political education can mean many things to many people. For us, it is definitely not Civics 101. It is not a political science class. Uh, it is often uh, education outside of formal institutions. It is education ideally within movement spaces, however that's defined. And it's for consciousness raising, for justice, and for liberation. Some people call it popular education. Some folks call it movement education. It can be in unions, in book clubs, in consciousness raising groups, in theater, and in song. Fundamentally, it's about assessing power dynamics in society and accessing power, the power of the people. And that usually entails redefining power dynamics in the learning space itself, right? And inverting, equalizing, um, those, those relationships so that everyone are co-learners together, not the teacher pouring into uh, a quote unquote student. So in the spirit of political history, uh, I am wearing a particular hat today and there is only the prize of satisfaction <laughs> if at some point in today's dialogue, you are able, without looking it up on the internet, <laughs> to figure out what 306 is referring to. So that's our little um, challenge for today. All right, so with that said, we are going to start with you, Jen. Um, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank Zara and the other organizers of this great conference and this great conversation, and Alethea to help moderate, and Coco and Brian, looking forward to this conversation as well. And you know, when I think about my movement lineage, I think about being in fifth grade 
and learning about Frances Perkins, who was uh, the first woman to be in the presidential cabinet as Secretary of Labor. And I think about in that moment and in that history class on how you know I was taught about what was happening with the New Deal at, during that time, the presidential um, objections and other things. But I wasn't really taught in regards to what was happening with UAW, for example, their first strike. And that came later on uh, through my trajectory in work and labor union. And I really think about who's helping me think through um, and sharpening my organizing and my political education is really organizations like Detroit Action, Missouri Jobs with Justice, and Organizing for a Black Struggle. And in these organizations, the most impacted are the, the ones that are centered, their voices are centered, and worker voices are amplifi amplified. Um, but most importantly, everyday experiences are connected to the systems of oppression. And it's not an individual problem, but rather a collective historical systematic issue that these organizations really lean in on amplifying and uh, allowing for everyday folks to connect and to also use their power to change. I also feel that regarding um, movement history and political ed, when I think about my experience, I think about the time that I was in St. Louis, which is a predominantly black city, and we connected at that time, uh, SAU Local One, uh, where I was working, we were fighting against right to work. Um, we successfully repealed it on the ballot. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, workers also stood strong with their union and wanted to ensure that they had their collective bargaining. But in order to get there, it was really about talking about the racist history of right to work. Um, and you know, leaders such as Vance Muse in the 1930s being the person that was really arc, um, orchestrating this right to work. I have a quote, um, you know, from, he was quoted to say, from now on, white women and white men will be forced into organizations with black African apes whom they will have to call brother and, or lose their jobs. These were the sentiments that were brought forth for right to work. And when having conversations with members and connecting the, or the racist history and the origin of right, to work, of right to work, I would connect it to the present, to where who, who in the 1% the that's holding the wealth in this country, how do they look like? And if you look at, if you look at the demographics, they're predominantly white men. And so questions, it became, so to your point earlier about co-learning, it became to about me providing the context and the historical history about what was happening with right to work and how it was brought forth and where we were in present day, and then asking questions such as, you know, was that by chance or design that the top 1% are white men? Um, how does that impact your day to day? And what does it mean if you lose your collective bargaining power? How would you have the capacity to change your wages and other working conditions at the workplace? And I really was really able to think through as I was reflecting for my time today on how movement history is, for me, is to look at the origins of the oppression, of the systems of oppression, and connect to present day. And also, it is also what laid the strategic muscle to allow us to have the capacity to fight for our collective bargaining for the contracts coming, coming up ahead. So not only were we using political education about right to work for the moment of us facing the battle of right to work, but it also provided the strategic muscle for our members to understand why the long haul of their contract fights were important. So excited for this conversation. Good afternoon, everybody. It's always nice to be in these settings. I always feel a little bit like of an imposter sometimes because, but I know that I'm here to just like give my experience as to what we've done so far. Um, I'm part of two organizations. One is a Marxist-Leninist organization and one is a mass organization. Um, we do different studies with both groups. Um, the mass organization, from our experience, what has really helped um, uh, so to start, basically, the political education is, is like uh, sowing a seed. It's um, really about gaining long-term commitment from people so that people understand what they're struggling for and why it's necessary for them to struggle. Because the reality is that this struggle, the struggle that we carry out to free 
the masses of people from oppression is not easy and it gets hard. It gets uh, very hard sometimes. And in the hard times, people need to understand what they're there for, that, it's, um, that this is a thing of necessity that we have to do. So for us with the mass organization, we always start by, um, we have this basic study. It's Pedag Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Fieri. And then we go into Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. And then we end that basic study with the State and Revolution by Lenin. The point of this is to build this connection for folks that the basic, some, the basic relationship sometimes is that of the oppressor and oppressed. And this relationship is um, mirrored in many different relationships. Uh, sometimes in the school with the teacher and the student um, in public education, sometimes it's in that way. Um, the police and society. Um, sometimes even, and it gets a little like, this is, it, sometimes it gets uncomfortable for people because it gets into their real lives. Like we have this conversation about sometimes it's, it's the husband and wife relationship can be oppressive. Um, but we just make these things clear for people because people have to understand what oppression is and what it looks like. And sometimes it's violent and sometimes it's overt, but you have to be able to understand that. And then we get into Wretched of the Earth because it gets into this basic relationship again between colonized and colonizer and what that does to the psyche of the colonized in terms of like how we view our oppression, our willingness to struggle against oppression. Um, and then we end with the state and revolution because it gets into the proletariat and bourgeoisie contradiction, um, which is what we find in this, in this society is that a lot of workers are exploited. In the other organization, we do a Marxist-Leninist political theorem, basically. It's all basic documents from Marxist-Leninist literature. Um, again, though, this is also related to the, our understanding of movement history like the Black Panthers and the Young Lords. Uh, the Black Panthers were a communist organization, and because we championed them so much, we understood that we should study the way they studied and study what they studied, but also apply it to our current conditions that we find here today. Now, when we started, we started after our organization is brand new. It's called Workers Movement for Liberation, but it formerly was known as Mexicanos Unidos. We started after the George Floyd protests because we saw it as a necessity. Now, we see here that and there are a lot of diaspora organizations in New York City and throughout the country because obviously, obviously there are a lot of oppressed communities in the United States and in New York City. But we started out as a diaspora organization. We wanted to only organize Mexicans. That was our primary thing, mainly because uh, the majority of us were Mexicans, so that's how we saw things. But through the course of our studies, we understood that the nationalist organizing only goes so far and at a certain point, it does become reactionary in the sense that like now you're just basically trying to get privileges for your own national diaspora. Um, so we understood the necessity of doing a multinational organization that encompasses all oppressed people. Um, because here in our society, sometimes we have very separatist mindsets when it comes to the struggle. Intellectuals with intellectuals, feminists with feminists, colored people with colored people. Um, and we don't see it that way. We see the need to have a multinational organization that encompasses multi multiple different oppressed identities. We see this though, we come to this conclusion through our political education and not because somebody told us to do that. It's because we came to that understanding by ourselves through our education. This is necessary for, uh, in order to get like a sustainable movement really. Um, that's how we see that. Um, uh, the main thing too about our political education is understanding the development of things. Um, we see here, and because, and so we see the relationship between the base and the superstructure, that the base is capitalism. Therefore, the superstructure is going to mirror that base. And that's why you get a lot of exploitative laws being made. Culture is also, uh, the mainstream culture, it, it pushes this uh, capitalist agenda, basically. It's just important for people to understand that we can win, basically, and that these things can be changed. But people need to come to that understanding by themselves so that they can commit long-term to the movement. Without that long-term commitment, things are likely to rely on spontaneity. And we saw the George Floyd movement as something that was spontaneous, and that in the end, a lot of people were left disillusioned 
because the main goal of that movement was to defund the police and what we see after that is that the police get more funding so we have to again go back to the drawing board to the study and see where we went wrong and why it happens this way so that we can get better at what we do so political education again is just truly important so people can understand and stay in the in the struggle long term and see the necessity of organizing without seeing the necessity people won't organize that's Hey everyone, how's everyone doing out here? Oh, I'm gonna ask it one more time. How's everyone doing out here? Okay, oh my gosh. Um, such a powerful panel that got us started this morning. Thank y'all. And although we are on a stage, we are really wanting to speak on the level with all of you. So hope that you're thinking about what you wanna contribute with questions, comments in, dias in, in our dialogue today. Um, initially wanna share gratitude to Alethea, to Jen, to Leo for this exchange up top. Uh, to Maddie, Sarah, Zara, the interpreters, uh, the panelists for today, and all the folk at Fordham and, and SLU who had put together this event. Also gratitude to y'all for choosing to come here together. Um, Grace Lee Boggs, uh, the late great Grace Lee Boggs had this phrase, what time is it on the clock of the world? And I uh, want to name that um, this is a period of global solidarity with Palestine. Um, and I'm going to be showing some images through uh, my short presentation, so really encourage all, feel free to take some photos, um, feel free to, um, to return back to these images. Um, this is an emergency solidarity moment, um, and the United States government has been actively supporting the Israeli genocide of Palestinians. Uh, when we're talking about political education and movement history, we need to name these atrocities that are happening, um, that our government is actively supporting, and um, that many Jews here in the United States and around the world are opposing. Um, so learning about the 75-year occupation of Palestine, immersing our communities in political education and action are going to be needed to stop this genocide. So for my contribution, I wanna lay out just a couple of vibrant entry points, although not blueprints, for thinking about social movement histories and political education. I wrote this book called New York Liberation School, um, which celebrates the extraordinary legacies of direct action, creative writing, institutional change at CUNY. And this was and continues to be an ongoing process of desegregating our university admissions, decolonizing our curriculum, and rupturing the borders between our classrooms and surrounding communities. Uh, the heartbeat of this story is the creation of Harlem University in April 1969, when black and Puerto Rican students, teachers, community members took over multiple City College of New York buildings and transformed the campus and neighborhood into a freedom school. Now, this event forever changed the students and teachers involved. For the rest of their lives, the poems, essays, short stories, letters, uh, communiques that they were producing all served as mobile liberation zones or portable classrooms that people passed hand to hand, generation to generation, to spread this legacy of Harlem University. Now, this didn't happen out of nowhere, um, but by people converging and taking action, taking risks where they were. So in particular, I wanna lift up the SEEK program, Search for Education, Elevation, and Knowledge program, which y'all heard about um, a little bit in the earlier panel, which was this amazing coalitional force of black Puerto Rican feminist pedagogies that were a nucleus for these actions. And as we know, at City College, at Queens College, and other CUNY schools, SEEK was um, this incredible convergence space. And at the risk of turning our elders' wisdoms into bumper stickers, um, wanna name a couple of different CUNY legacies um, uh, or some CUNY movement pedagogies through these three people, Audre Lorde, June Jordan, and Asada Shakur. Um, so, I want for you to sit and savor uh, these kinds of distillations. Learning is something you can incite, literally incite, like a riot. Insist that your studies shall become life studies, black studies, urban studies, environmental studies. While practice without theory bangs its head against a brick wall, theory without practice lulls itself to sleep. So, what I was hoping to do was to create a kind of anthology um, in this book of all of these different movement interventions that these folk were making during this time, but also how this relates to our current university and city struggles now. So we can really inherit and wield the power of these ancestors by reading alongside them, freedom dreaming with them, and acting from the own leaps that they took in their time into our present. 
Now, uh, these folks at City College and CUNY were uh, not acting alone. They were in a larger wave of radical feminist interventions in print culture, study groups, consciousness raising, protest organizations. And they were doing what we could call a revolution within the revolution, right? So challenging both the political and economic power structures, but also challenging the misogyny, the heterosexist attitudes by men in movements um, that they were also um, being harmed by. And I try to hold these lessons close as a person who is also fallible, who's been shaped and disfigured by capitalism, because we're still so ingrained in these hurtful ways that we've been socialized to inflict harm on each other. And by nourishing accountability in our classrooms, in our movement spaces, in our relationships, we can make sure not to perpetuate the violence of our oppressors. So what was a kind of method that they used? Um, sometimes people will refer to uh, workers' inquiries or militant research as ways that people can um, have a kind of partisan involvement in scholarship. Uh, Cynthia earlier was talking about, you know, let's do away with this fiction of objectivity. What do we come into in work? What do we choose to lift up in our, our scholarship? Um, researching to create change from within. And there's a couple of different examples of what this militant research has looked like past and present in CUNY and also more broadly. But this is also in CUNY in New York, a hemispheric conversation, a global conversation. So any times that there are education struggles that are happening here, we're also reaching our arms with folks um, doing this work in different parts of the world. And I want to lift up, um, uh, or just before I get to that, a few examples of ways that we've used movement research and creating curriculum to then produce uh, teaching and learning lessons of uh, CUNY movements. This is one in 2020 to speak about uh, police and prison abolition that a campaign called Free CUNY had crunched the numbers to see what would happen if we were to actually take all of the CUNY police budgets and reinvest that into different parts of our university. So to think very tangibly about how to not just have an analysis, but how to circulate it in a, in a really accessible way. Um, so but broadening it out um, before closing soon, thinking about how this relates to struggles that are happening in the hemisphere, right, in the Caribbean and in Latin America. We have all of these incredible examples that we can reach towards in thinking about our struggles here in CUNY, thinking of in Puerto Rico, the University of Puerto Rico strikes, their creation of mutual aid centers after Hurricane Maria, thinking in Brazil and Bolivia, that movements have basically come into formal uh, teaching and learning institutions in order to change them, to create a kind of dual power from below. Um, want to lift up in Chiapas, uh, the Zapatistas' vision for indigenous autonomy through study, that they're operating on a kind of 500-year timeline of insurgency. Um, also thinking of in Chile and Argentina, uh, challenging patriarchy through feminist strikes, through different kinds of performance art, um, that there's a real vibrancy to feminist struggles in the Americas and the Caribbean that we can learn from today. And uh, just last, want to lift up that we're in an incredible moment of political education right now in CUNY. CUNY for Palestine has been doing all of these teach-ins, workshops, protests, research clusters, civil disobedience. All of this is intensive study that's geared towards urgent repair now. And when people are galvanized to make sense of and intervene in this historic moment, it is so very telling that university administrators want to suppress us, Zionists want to demonize us, Anti-Semitic po politicians want to sabotage us while suddenly claiming support for Jews. And liberals want to say, quote unquote, it's complicated, as if that should be the end of our focus on Palestine rather than the deepening of our focus on Palestine. Um, so in the uh, little bit of time that I have left, want to um, name that there are a few events that are coming up, including getting to speak about black and Puerto Rican pedagogies at Baruch. And um, this upcoming Tuesday, there being a research cluster on divestment um, to, to continue the, um, the movement in support with, with Palestine. But um, really honored to be a part of this discussion and um, excited for what we can build together. Where does the time go? Oh my goodness. So we have around 10 minutes or so for our conversation here and then opening out to the 
to the audience and I have two really big juicy questions, but I also <laughs> want to invite a few questions for each other. I don't know how we'll do it all, but we'll, we'll try. I'm curious about um, meaning making, right? There's a saying, it's not about what happens to you, it's the meaning that you, you make of it. And given that we are all raised in systems that tend to be default capitalist, tend to be default patriarchal, right? We tend to have these internalized things. Like, what do you find is most effective in helping folks move towards the revolutionary rather than the reactionary? What also helps people root themselves in revolutionary hope and joy given all of the ills that we're fighting? And then what does it mean to you to construct a history of the future? And that's connecting Coco with what you shared around a 500 year history <laughs> that one's living into. Um, What does it mean to sort of make a history of the future? And how do, do, do these learning spaces cultivate folks' understanding, like the long arc, that they are pivotal actors within? Maybe those questions are actually for all of us, <laughs> as, as well as we have a, a dialogue. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is my time at, in Detroit. So in, while I was in Detroit, there were a lot of things happening. It was during 2020. Um, you know, for those who may not know, Detroit faced a, a really large foreclosure crisis um, due to overassessments on taxes. Um, and so when I think about meaning making, when we were thinking about the uprising of George Floyd and also the mur murder of Breonna Taylor during that time. We were really thinking about also like in connection to the housing crisis on how the system was built towards protection of capital and of, um, you know, and, and the core of it of white supremacy, right? And so when we were talking, doing political education with our members, really having the ability to tease out how white supremacy and white supremacist practices were happening in, the, in a predominantly black city of Detroit. So why was it in a predominantly black city of Detroit? Detroit is losing their homes um, due to overassessment on taxes, right? And being pushed out of their own city while you had b millionaires or billionaires can't keep track of how much money these folks have these days, like Dan Gilbert, who was buying up property and then raising rents for people to stay in their homes. And when I think about hope and joy, during the coalition, what we did for the foreclosure is that we, we invited folks to share their stories of how, you know, even though among losing their homes, they, they were committed and stayed in Detroit, and they were able to like have the capacity to then be in community with their neighbors about the work up ahead, right? And we were able to pass really positive legislations at city council level to allow for like overassessment not to happen again, but also what does restoration look like for those who were overassessed? And I think when I think about the history of the future, um, it's similar to what Brian was saying earlier, which is like a multiracial, democracy is what's needed in this time. And I think about how even with the, f the foreclosure coalition, it was in partnership with uh, multiple organizations that represented several um, entities and demographics of Detroit, but overall in the center, it being a story about black Detroiters fighting for their homes and fighting for, th fighting for their communities. It's about, um, so the political education is meant to also create and nurture consciousness and also politicize your daily life. 
We say that the more narrow your consciousness is, the less you miss. We, an example is that if there's no bus line in your community, if you're not conscious of the fact that that's politics and that there's no bus line because of politics, you miss, you don't miss it necessarily. You don't say, you just say there's no bus line here and that's the end of that. But if you understand that it's because of politics that you don't have a bus line, then you begin to kind of uh, become a little bit more revolutionary because it is about your daily life. And we explain to people that if you want change, like again, sometimes the, the struggle is selfish. I want, I want free housing. I want better work. I want accessible education. But you realize that you can't do this without everybody else wanting the same thing and organizing for the same thing. So that's um, a way to keep people revolutionary. Another way to like make people still base themselves in the joy and like in the in the the happiness of the organizing. Also, is the fact that you have to recommit every day to to the struggle. It is a something that you recommit every day. Um, and so when you find that other people are recommitting with you and people are committed just as much as you, there's joy in that because you come back and you find others that are willing to struggle with you. Um, and then the last thing is just that people have to understand, this is through political education, that the revolution is not done when you have power, that there's still other work to do once you take power. There is still more to do and that this is a long time struggle and that you realize that after winning one struggle, you have another struggle right behind there. Uh, whether it's for clean water or whether it's for housing or education, there's another struggle waiting right behind that struggle. So it's just understanding that um, so people don't get demoralized and become fatalistic about the struggle. Um, I'll add in a little bit more and also really keen to hear from, from y'all in the room, so I'll try to keep it quick. So I want to talk a little bit about the past and about the future and maybe we can meet in the present. Uh, I feel like a lot of hope and inspiration that we have from previous emancipation struggles, um, sometimes it's something that we want to almost, because it's a kind of already a package of a vision of what emancipation had looked like or what fugitivity or marronage, um, people escaping oppressive conditions to create something elsewhere, what that looked like that often people might try to think about how to bring that into the present. And I struggle with this a little bit because I think that sometimes when we may have a, a really clear focus on movement upheavals that worked from the 16th to the 19th century, and we try to think about how to bring those emancipatory lessons into the present, in a way it may be thinking about um, kind of lifting up lessons from one period of time and then putting it into another. Um, when we're in a vastly different situation than life under, uh, um, you know, life under chattel slavery um, or the kind of upheavals that people had done um, to overthrow enslavement, thinking about what kinds of lessons are in the present for that. So that's a question with y'all that I'm thinking about. Another is looking into the future. I think there's um, a way that um, in Detroit and in, in other parts of uh, the country and the world, people have really embraced this kind of ethos that all organizing is science fiction and that folks are looking at you know speculative fiction looking into the future um, as ways how to try to make our way out of this nightmare of the present um, but i feel like there's also some difficulties with that too because if we might have a kind of very clear view about what a future can look like and then work backwards from there it may not necessarily give us a sense about what materials, what conditions we have in this moment in order to get to that liberatory different future. And so I think sometimes how we relate to a potential future um, is something that we can maybe you know, get stuck in the imagination phase rather than in thinking about, okay, what is possible right now in order to get us to a life after capitalism or a life after where we have to pay rent or a life after where we can't afford childcare um, and so really want to think with you all about how to have like an imagination for the future, but to also be thinking about what we can do really concretely in our present moment, in our communities, in our schools, um, in order to get there rather than it just being um, like a freedom dreaming exercise with no roots. Um, so, but yeah, wanted to throw that in and uh, really hope that this can be a, a community dialogue. So keen to hear from y'all what you're thinking about.
the 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 genies and witches of time are on our side today, so we have an extra 10 or 15 minutes for this session. And I, I wonder, before we open it up to the audience, if there are any questions you have for each other, given the nuggets that were shared. Okay, um, really curious, uh, you know, I was really, um, thanks for your slides, oh, sure. and then I was really interested about the worker inquiries and like the research, and so, yeah, like how do you see the role of academia um, in when it comes to movement history and like political education? Just super quickly, I think um, kind of building upon what uh, folks had shared in the previous panel, when people who are deeply invested in something, really excited about a movement history, but then come in already with expectations, come in with that framing that's already cooked, then it's almost like, we want to hear of your movement legacies, but also we our questions have already been answered and how we're framing it, right? And something that's really powerful about workers' inquiries or militant research or there's other ways that people have, have named it is that it's coming in with a kind of uh, openness to be changed by what you're studying and, and being involved in. Um, it's not coming in with blueprints, um, even if you may have some kind of movement perspectives or, or a sense of political orientation. Um, I think there's ways that when people are in a struggle Often we don't stop to say, how are we assessing and making sense of this struggle as we're in it? And you know, I would love for there to be more conversation on like oral testimonies, oral histories, while people are in the middle of like a spicy Black Lives Matter demonstration. How do we document and archive that? Um, for people to talk about what it means for not just what happens in like classroom exchanges, but when people are then taking the subway ride home from class, so then like that's when some of the real conversations come into motion like is that being archived right um and so you know i think just like a commitment to curiosity and not having a predetermined sense of what those answers are um can mean that it's a lot more fruitful when we're that's right revolution will not be televised um and to add to that you know we saw asada shakur earlier she has this phrase um, you will not be, you know, the ruling power won't give you the education you need to overthrow them, right? So thinking about what kinds of different educational and learning spaces we can make. Um, I had a question for you. I'm curious if um, yeah. you'd be willing to share um, from St. Louis to Detroit if there are some really specific kind of movement um, perspectives from these past 60s and 70s struggles in those two areas that people we're passing along to, to your generation. Um, and yeah, just thinking about um, sharing lessons from, from one period of struggles to the next. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, I think for me, you know, thinking about the 1960s and the role St. Louis and Detroit played during that period, um, especially, you know, the riots that came after the murder of you know Martin Luther King and um, a lot of things that have happened during that time, I do feel that there was um, a lot of reignitement that needed to be made, if that makes sense, around the power that the community has, that especially the black community has, um, especially the the generations that I was working with. Uh, folks, um, some people were from that time period, but the younger folks really tapping back into the history of the city and tapping back into the power. And I think a connection between St. Louis and Detroit is, you know, in St. Louis, we worked on a campaign um, where we were trying to uni unionize Express Scripts. Um, and Express Scripts was a facility or organization that had come really strongly on the support of the Ferguson Commission report. Uh, so they were saying yes to black lives on paper, but yet their black janitors weren't, uh, didn't have the capacity to livable wage or union protections, not even healthcare. 
Um, and so that contradiction was similar in Detroit, right? Well, I already named the housing crisis. And so what I saw was very much so the connection of just like how um, the decline or the inability to really see the power that these communities hold um, because of the decline of unionization or the misrepresentation of what black communities can do to move themselves forward was evident be from like 1960s to where we are today. And I think the uprisings have shown, you know, that there is power and there are, you know, movements for black lives, organizations on the ground really working strongly to make sure that we m bring change. Where we know that defund the police um, has gone in the wrong direction, um, we definitely feel that it is an opportunity to still continue to talk about how policing was brought forward for the fact that it was to protect capital, right? It was to protect property. Um, and it was, like, there's racist origins of the poli policing as well. And so I think for me, like when I think about the 1960s struggle in connection to today, I think about the gap, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, thank you for the question. theory and practice and also centralize efforts but also decentralize efforts it's like the contradiction of like how do we centralize but also decentralize because there are a lot of organizations and a lot of uh, schools a lot of clubs there's a lot of worker unions um, and everyone needs to struggle according to their conditions and their need but at the same time there needs to be some type of conversation constant communication between these organizations so that we can centralize efforts um, and maximize really our energy, honestly. That and like, um, well, in terms of political education, um, I guess it's really how do you, how do we balance all levels, essentially? Because sometimes you're in a room with different levels of political education and some people are a little bit more advanced, some people are just becoming into this uh, consciousness. So I guess it's just a challenge for everybody in terms of like how do you keep education settings like this uh, balance or at like what you mentioned earlier about being on the same field, on the same level. Um, I think that that's super key is um, that uh, having camaraderie relations is what we call it in terms of study. Just everybody seeing each other eye to eye. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how much study you've done. It doesn't matter how much experience you have. It's the fact that everybody knows something and we're all bringing it to the table to see. I just, I bring this up because I have this um, problem sometimes in the mass organization where sometimes people come and they just wanna listen, which is fine at first. But at first people are always like, you know more than I do, well, why don't you just give me the answer? And so it's really about like, how do we kind of like gradually bring this out of the people? Um, we deal with a lot of uh, the immigrant working class. Um, in Mexico, the education system is not that great. If you live in a rural area, especially if you're a woman, um, you have, um, your education only goes so far. Some of them only go to like third grade, fourth grade. Um, so their literacy is um, not up there. So again, it's about making this education accessible, still having text, still having visuals, still having conversation. It's just a synthesis of like education. So my, I guess the real thing is like, how, what's your education method basically? Like, um, just because we do studies, but we also do film screenings and we also have actions. We also believe that rallying and actions and political activity is educational. Uh, Asambleas, yeah, so.
tell you right now, it's illegal. Whatever they're doing is illegal. <laughs> and I'd rather not. Whatever they're doing, I mean, as a little girl, I used to watch Dr. King, and I always got, because he, he ran pretty much the 1199 Union, and my mother was a nurse, you know. And the men didn't like him because the women was making a fuss over him all the time, and they were like, you know. But I always got the sense they were discussing something that no one ever was gonna know about. And if someone found out about it, it would ruin everything. You understand? But what he was doing in the eyes of the world was illegal. He was black and walking. That was illegal. All right? And even in the Floyd move, whatever you're going to do in a real movement, the minute you start, it's illegal. So why would you go out and tell everybody about it? All right? That's putting you at risk. Okay? You know, you find out stuff years later. Years later, you found out that Harriet Tubman is hanging out in Brooklyn. When you get out J Street Metro Tech, there's an old church there that NYU owns. That church on Emancipation Day had Lincoln, the slaves, everybody hanging out in there. Then she had some place on Sackett Street. I'm from Park Slope, all right? Who knew? You find this out two, 300 years later. You know, you can't go around telling people your business. It's impossible. The revolution, like they say, will not be televised. This is not, you know, the Brady Bunch, you know? And then one way to get everybody involved is to teach them to teach them what will happen when they protest. It was very dangerous. Women, children, with the dogs and the whips and the chains, you know? So when you get everybody in there, you have to let them know this is not a playground. Even when we were going doing the, the community gardens, all of that, we had trainings on how to lock arms, all of that. That's nobody's business. Are you crazy? Thank you for that. Um, when I taught at SUNY Albany as a part of the Underground uh, Railroad History Project, and you're powerfully reminding us that there are Underground Railroad histories all throughout this country and the state and here in New York, and there's a physical footprint to that history that often remains so hidden and what does it mean to activate it, to reconnect to that legacy? And I'm also reminded of Civil War reenactors, which was really not in my line of sight until I spent some time in Virginia. And I wonder about what it, would it mean for us on the progressive <laughs> radical side to create reenactments of our own liberatory histories as ways of bringing them, bringing them to life in a different way. So thank you. I just wanted to check if, the, um, if there are other questions in the room, but also any questions from our online audience. Um, to, to piggyback on the Civil War reenactments, there is an artist named Dred Scott yeah. um, who has done that work in regards to like reenacting like slave rebellions in that practice. So like, just want to shout that person out for folks to be aware of of that person because I think that's really important to think about. And like during this conversation, something I'm thinking about is like wondering if we're like living in this age of consumption where like instead of like doing actions it's almost like you consume like these panels these talks these readings and then the like i guess philosophical awareness is like the end product so like not try like making it further than that and i don't know if it's a comment or a question but it's like how do we get from the 
political education part to like the action part and like like what does that how how can that be perceived or look like I want to call out Carol Lynch, who's here, who is an artist who's also done amazing work about remembering the past. We've also worked together on a project in the 1990s called Repo History, where he literally put metal street signs up here and around the city talking about lost or forgotten stories until Giuliani tried to shut us down many years later, but we kept going for a while. So there's a lot of artists beside Dredd, whose project uh, Slave Rebellion is amazing. Uh, but there's a lot of artists who've been doing this kind of work and a lot of people who are sort of like, you know, they're artists, but they're also sort of urban activists and it's a whole complex sort of, uh, do you want to say something? Okay, anyway, just to say. I just want to invite and comment on that question of study and action and how to enable both. Um, Brian, you had asked earlier just sort of how, like, what are the methods? You know, when I did political education with um, union members, I would use it as a, what we would do is like the house agenda during one-on-ones, which is basically like an agitational conversation that you have with someone about, you know, what we would say dusting off and ha reminding them their power, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I would just utilize that framework to really think about political ed. So I would, I would have the historical information, of course, um, and also connections to the present, but then it was like agitational questions about, you know, what, is, what does this mean for us and what does this mean for our day to day and what are we gonna do about it? So to your question, you know, when we were fighting right to work and having political education about the right to origins of right to work, you know, it was about connecting well, it means, it means signing up with your union, right? To make sure that your union's strong um, so you can have collective bargaining. So where we did those type of programs, we had over 80% of the memberships re recommit to the community, uh, recommit to the union, talking again about that long-term commitment. And then it was also about how are we gonna be stronger in the contract fight? Now we know this history. We know why Right to Work was created. It was created to keep black people um, oppressed and black people in a position that wouldn't have the capacity to earn good wages and have liv livable ways of living. Um, and so for me, it was like taking that knowledge and then how do we, how do we intensify our contract campaigns into rallies, into strikes, into all the measurements of things that would be a successful campaign to get the things that we wanted off the table. And then when we did Express Scripts, it was an easier translation because here we had a company that said they were for black lives, similar to like other situations in, across the country. And then yet they had their own black employees in their own building, not having access to livable wages or not having access to healthcare. And so I think those were the things that really solidified it. It was like, here's the origin or history around what we're doing, and then what are we gonna do about it to change it in a really active way? I'm glad you um, said something about the unions. Uh, in New York, we, all, we have the Taylor Law, I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, it's been around, it's been around for a long time. If the union can't, Unions been, if the unions can't do anything about the Taylor Law in New York, how are we going to do anything about political action anywhere else? This this would be the perfect litmus test of getting the law repealed altogether, or at least modified to make it at least uh, workable to uh, to more fair fair um, gain. Oh, the Taylor Law in New York is where if the union goes on, public sector unions, we uh, emphasize that, public sector unions cannot go on strike in New York without incurring severe penalties such as, uh, 
every day you go on strike, that's two days pay, I believe. I'm not sure the details anymore. And the union gets, incurs other penalties. I can't remember that either. But it's basically, it's like a um, cyanide pill for workers and the union. Thoughts on that? Um, I'm so grateful for this question and for what folks have lifted up. This question on the revolution will not be televised, making sure that we're not kind of you know, in, in sharing these movement experiences and strategies to not open ourselves up to repression. Um, thinking about all these different kinds of past and present examples of how people brought in movement histories, um, not just waiting for the powers that be to enshrine those. And then this question of like ways how to take real risks when there are these potential penalties. Um, there's someone I wanna bring into the room, the late Jeffrey Perry, who was a postal worker organizer um, and also a historian of this amazing uh, Harlem radical named Hubert Harrison. And Jeffrey Perry once had this thing to say about the Taylor Law. He's like, it's not an illegal strike if you win. And so I <laughs> want for us to really hold on to that, this question of like, it's, it's an assumption that if we're challenging the powers that be, then they're going to throw all different kinds of things at us to try to dissuade us from recognizing our own power, right? Um, but we do need to be thinking about how to take collective risks, including against unjust laws. Um, we need to be thinking about if, for example, in CUNY, right, there's a campaign called CUNY on Strike that's trying to think about really consciously what we can do to uh, develop the capacity to take strike action that will not just be for CUNY students and campus workers. We would be involving our families. We'd be involving transit. We'd be involving all of the unions and those who are non-unionized but equally powerful, right? Um, and I think it brings us to, you know, this question of um, that we need to be preparing in a way for things getting a lot spicier before us coming to the promised land, so to speak, you know. There will have to be an above ground and underground orientation to movement work for us to lovingly talk with each other about what that will look like, how to support each other as we're taking risks. Um, I think that it'll also be, you know, really a need for us to look at other kinds of lessons of how people took collective action and I wanna bring one in in closing. Some of y'all may be familiar with this documentary called The Take, or The Toma, in Argentina. And this was after 2001, a major economic crisis. All of the wealthy left. They literally had suitcases of cash. They left in airplanes, leaving the working classes of Argentina to try to you know, figure out what to do. Um, and there were these workers at factories that said, you know, our bosses, they keep telling us that we're not smart, that we don't know how to run these establishments, that we need them. Um, but when we found out that the boss left and we went into his office and then learned about how to run this factory ourselves, it's not that difficult. It's just addition and subtraction, right? So, you know, recognizing that we actually have this incredible reservoir of knowledge, of movement experience, you know, we don't necessarily need academics to tell us what to think about our struggles, um, but we do need for academics to become accomplices in these struggles. Um, so, you know, wanna um, uh, cede the floor to see if y'all have anything more to add on to those pieces. Yeah. A little bit about, um, we understand that there is a need to mix legal and illegal tactics. That's just a, a basic understanding that we have um, today, they've the the right to assemble is under attack. They don't let you assemble, and it's important part in this uh, struggle that we have. People understanding why the right to assemble is important. Uh, that we need to defend it. We need to struggle for it, both through legislation, but also in the streets. Uh, people need to make that known. Um, well, this also touches a little bit on w what was like a thing for us. Uh, this understanding of violence. Um, violence through political education was super important for people to understand that the oppressor's violence is not the same as the oppressed violence. Um, we say this because we also understand that not everybody is going to take that type of action. Not everybody wants to take that type of action. And we think that that's fine. That's okay. But it's important for these folk not to condemn people who take that type of action because then you're playing into the oppressor's hand. It's okay if you don't want to take that action, but understand why some people feel the need to or see the necessity to, i.e. Palestine. Okay, that was important for us to have that conversation with the people in our plaza and the mass organization so that they can understand that this is a long, uh, this, 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 um, this conflict didn't start October 7th. 
started a long time ago. And so it's important for people to understand, as I mentioned earlier, the development of conflict, the development of how these things arise in order to have a real complete understanding of it. The other thing is that political education is meant to boil the water. We use this, um, we use this term because it's, it's about how things change from liquid to gas and gas to solid or in whatever way is that it does need to happen at a specific temperature, at least for water. Water freezes at a specific temperature and it boils at a specific temperature. It might be hot, but it might not be boiling. And you might be able to throw something in the water and it might get softer and you might be able to eat it, but you might, it might not do you any good because the water wasn't boiling, if that makes any sense. Political education is meant to make the water hotter to the point where it boils and to the point where you can do something else now because the water is boiling. And until that water isn't boiling, you can't take certain type of action. We see that. People need to understand the collective risks that is involved in taking action. Because in me taking action, I also inadvertently put Connor in danger, basically, because now he's also at risk of being repressed. It's just the, the nature of this collective struggle that we take is that everybody needs to be on the same page. The last thing about how political education can lead to, to, to action is that sometimes that is not a very um, direct link. Sometimes it's not cause and effect. Sometimes it's not because you do political education, you take action. Sometimes it's something in the middle. Now for us, political education is important because of how transient this movement is and how transient people are. People tend to move relocate. So the point is, is if this four person study circle, we have to train each other. So if Jennifer moves to Detroit tomorrow, the Ch Jennifer is an able organizer who's already conscious and, and, and is able to take action over there. So it's kind of like that, basically. It's like, uh, but sometimes it is cause and effect. And in, in our practice, the way we try to do political education is we study and then an action that we ask members to do is write on that study or make it relevant to today and then we can make a leaflet or an agitation paper and take it to the streets and give it to somebody who is not conscious and see how they react to this piece of paper um, and see how we can agitate them. Sometimes it, it goes from political education to rallies. But sometimes again, the, 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 it's not deterministic in the way where it's like cause and effect. But yes, political education is meant to plant a seed. And political education, we had this conversation in the pre-talk that political education has to be sustained. It has to be consistent. You cannot do political education once and expect that person to really assimilate all those ideas. You do need to come back to it over and over again, understanding that everything is connected. The way we talk about our initial study with the Marxist-Leninist group is we do consciousness of necessity, class struggle, the state, and then we talk about the need for a actual genuine workers party. That is the stage that we're at, is understanding that there is no genuine worker party out there today. And because of that, the workers' interests are never on the ballot, genuinely, and they're never there for debate. It's really just the Democrats and the Republicans, again, always playing the working class. The Trump movement does play on the white working class um, in other parts of America. The union struggle is important um, because there are more unions in New York City than there are in the South. And so there are things like that that we need to take into consideration in respect to specific questions. The last thing is we talked a little bit in the pre-talk about how the future is either socialism or fascism. And we, either, we need to get behind one or the other. And I hope everybody goes behind socialism because that is a proper path but we understand that trajectory and we also understand how it can easily develop out of the United States because we have a history of racism and racist structures that are fascist in nature. And so we see how that can come back and we see it through the Supreme Court. If you do wanna take away laws and rights, it is the Supreme Court and we see that, well, the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court and I, I, it's fascist in nature by the people who are on it, basically, because uh, I think three were chosen by Trump, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so again, it just puts us in danger constantly. Rights are constantly being overturned, the abortion right, the right to assemble is under attack. There are many other rights that do come under attack. Sometimes they do it through the state level. Now Trump is saying that all states have the right to decide for themselves, which is a stance that he changed on many times before. Point is, is this is socialism or fascism?
Yeah, so we have around uh, 10 minutes remaining. I want to check if there are any online questions to come in, um, just to be mindful of that stream. No? OK. Uh, any final questions from the audience before we do closing statements, Azar? Many questions, <laughs> but, so but I I'm gonna try to stay a little focused. Um, I am thinking about using movement history to show what's possible and to show our power. And if you would also comment on the ways that people use history to describe what you can't do. And I was really happy you brought up the Taylor Law because what we're seeing in the CUNY on strike movement right now is a lot of folks bringing up the MTA strike in 05 as um, a reason why this should not move forward. Um, and so how, how do you counter when, when someone provides like a historical example for why they think you should not take action, how you counter that and how you approach that? And then the other question I have is about this framework around legality and legal rights. And I know as a tenant organizer, if anyone invites me to their building to talk about tenants' rights, I will always, always go. And also, I think we get caught in this um, framework of rights and coloring in just inside the lines. And I was curious to hear how you all have handled that in your work. Um, and then for Brian, if you would talk in the context of worker assemblies and how that kind of goes in the free flow. That'd be awesome. Yeah, here I go. Um, so for, I, I want to lean in on the legality question. Um, as a union organizer, I would always call our movement lawyers and be like, so what can we do? And what is the consequence of us choosing a different path? Right. And so that really helped, you know, someone who has taken civil disobedience twice uh, for justice for janitors, it's, it just really has help me paint the picture, both for our members and also for myself as an organizer, of what are the risks and like calculating those risks, but also not being stuck in the box of what's legal and what's not legal, but like being, being strategic about what's the risk that I'm taking in order to change the lives for myself and for my community. And so that's how I approach the legality question. I think the movement history and what's possible um, so I worked predominantly in the Midwest with SAU Local One, and they were predominantly new uh, memberships. Uh, they had just, you know, had maybe one cycle or two cycles of a contract, so they weren't a historically Chicago-based. They were more uh, newer contracts, and so that's a different environment to be organizing, and I would always lean in around the fact that, you know, what the Chicago janitors, where we were founded in Local One, but then also like what happened in LA with Justice for Janitors campaign in the 90s, right? And so it, sometimes it's really hard um, to, if, you don't, if you don't touch back to like victories to see that you yourself have the opportunity, especially for the LA and the Justice for Janitors campaign. In Indianapolis, it was like 70 to 80% Latin A uh, communities. So it was really powerful to have that connection between those two groups and to be like, you know, these were the, this was their playbook. How do we learn from them and then also have the capacity to like m make it our own, right? In our climate, in our community. And that, that was really effective. And, you know, Indianapolis is still there, still thriving. There's members there in a right to work state. And so that's really exciting to like know that that, that looking back helped to sort of move them forward. Um, I wanted to have you all make statements and I'll close us out and hand it over to, Z to Zara. So, thank you. To answer, like, the briefly, is um, uh, we see that legal means need to be exhausted. We need to do legal means first because then people become disillusioned with the legal means and we see the necessity for the illegal means, whether it's uh, civil disobedience or whether it's occupying buildings. Um, 
but we, we see the necessity to exhaust legal means. Um, and the worker assemblies that you mentioned, we used to do worker assemblies in Sunset Park. Um, again, the, that was a multifaceted um, kind of method, really. It did many things. Uh, one of the things that it ensures is that you're not parachuting in. Um, that's a, we try to avoid going to neighborhoods thinking that we know what they want, know what they need. Um, you go there, you present a program, you present your thoughts and ideas, and you let people re really correct you. Um, tell you like, okay, that's good, but this is more important. And then you add that to your program and you move forward. Um, it also did something for the people because this is that was democracy for the people. Some of the people were undocumented. Some people haven't. They, they don't know that type of board, democracy. But because we were in an assembly and everybody had the right to speak and everybody had the right to input, everybody had the right to propose. That was democracy for these folks, and they got to see firsthand what grassroots democracy looks like and not top-down democracy. Um, the last thing that's really super important and not to be overlooked is a person's ability to begin to express themselves. These are people who prior to that maybe never got asked what they thought, never got asked how they feel. Um, and so they come here and then now they're being asked, what do you think, how do you feel, what do you think about this? And now people are like, all right, they want my opinion, they want my input, I'm gonna start to give it more. And people gradually begin to give it more. The anecdote I always give is that we had some folk who used to come and they used to speak very lowly like this. And now when they speak, it's like they have a microphone <laughs> and they speak loudly to make sure that the other person hears. It's small things like that that really do empower people and it begins to make the democracy more complete instead of just hearing the same voices in the room, um, which is like natural for people to do at first because people are like, you know, have anxiety about this. Um, so it does take, again, like I mentioned before, some consistency. Um, some type of like uh, constant form of this, of political education. Again, political education is daily. You have to learn how to politicize your life. Why is my train late? Why does my street not have any street lights? Why are these neighborhoods um, segregated in this way? Why is this specialized high school not have any colored people in there beside, and the, or the majority is um, white and Asian? Again, I bring this up because the specialized high schools today are very segregated, it's one of the primary places where people are segregated. Specialized high schools are tremendous opportunities. As somebody who went to one, I understand w how different my life was because I went to a specialized high school. But again, people need to begin to question this. Why are things the way they are? So that's the best part of political education. Oh, word. Um, just really quickly. Um, thinking about movement histories that are lifted up to negate or to undermine our power. Um, that's why we really need historians and cultural workers from below, um, you know, or else they'll be having us believe that Lincoln freed the enslaved or that the people of New York love Eric Adams, right? When we know that those two things are not true at all. Um, and, you know, specifically on this piece of rights, I feel like there's a way that sometimes social movements get stuck in demanding something, demanding rights from the state, um, from their employers, um, when ultimately, I mean, I'll speak in the I form, demanding rights from a state that I'm wanting to overthrow puts me in a little bit of a bind, right? Um, and at times, people who have um, uh, an indigenous kind of framework and an indigenous lineage talk about moving from rights to responsibilities. Not rights that we are given by the state or by our employers, but our responsibilities to each other. And to just kind of do a paradigm shift in that regard. And that it means that, you know, on a larger sense, we're moving from a kind of representational politics where we vote other people to make political decisions on our behalf, and they usually screw that up, to instead us thinking about how to directly participate in collectively being in society, working people reproducing New York City on a daily basis, and really taking that seriously. What does it mean to be directly involved in the contour of our lives with each other? That's power, that's also study, right? And you know, this final piece that you had started with, how does our uh, experiences with schooling then impact our kind of relationships with each other? I'm hoping that you know, for those of y'all who are educators in the room, for those of y'all who are students in the room, but also those of y'all who may see that you're kind of a little bit outside of a formal learning setting like CUNY, 
please consider what the role of radical study looks like as you're changing yourself, as you're changing relationships with others around you. Um, this is very much so, you know, what happens in a kind of freedom classroom can then get activated in other aspects of our lives, including people learning the power of their voice, including people learning to have an analytical sharpness to make sense of this world, but also to, to be in motion. And um, really hope that this is, you know, the, uh, the start of ongoing conversation, including getting to hear how this looks in terms of art interventions with the next panel that we'll have. So a lot of gratitude to y'all. To all of you, the panelists, to everyone who's in this room, I wish we had an opportunity to play together, uh, to play in transformational ways together, because it's very clear, as brother and sister artist over there who shared, there's so much richness and depth in this, in this room. I think uh, on a final note, what I will share is that we will never always agree and the richness and the differences in strategy needs to be robust and that our disagreements occur in ways that um, they generate new possibilities and they don't descend into toxicity where we're attacking each other. And uh, I raise that in, in light of Brian, what you shared about there has to be illegal and legal aspects of the struggle, and sometimes some of our comrades pursue a path of strategic violence, and then there are others of us who are dedicated to nonviolent struggle, but let's not do the oppressors' work for them by turning on each other uh, as we manage this great kind of diversity and democracy within us. So thank you all. I'll turn it back over to the organizers. Are we taking a break now? All right. Great. This panel is wrapped. Thanks so much. Oh my goodness. Did anyone guess? 306? Ah, uh, the Lorraine Motel. Is that a hint? The Lorraine Motel? April 4th, 1968. The assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. He was in the L Lorraine Motel, room 306. And he was standing on the balcony when he was assassinated. Most people don't know. That's that's true. And I will always also say there's a hiding in plain sight of like Rosa Parks radicalism and that Dr. King was at a strike. It was a labor action supporting Memphis sanitation workers. And I'm always amazed whenever we taught this within the union, how many people, people of color, were not aware that he was at a labor action. And that's what ended his, his life. So unmasking these hidden histories are really important, I think, for our people. All right, thank you for asking. Thanks. Time should folks return? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, so three o'clock.
anyway, no, no, I'm so totally. glad it was great. No, I, 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 I'm so glad you had your phone so I could text you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I just learned so much. I think all three conversations are so cool. Yeah.
All right, we're going to get uh, started with our uh, kind of last portion of this afternoon, and um, it's been so incredible to hear from all of our speakers so far today um, and from audience. Uh, it's been a really wonderful day, and uh, much appreciation to our interpreters who have been here um, since this morning with us, um, and much gratitude to everyone who has presented and shared. Um, before I introduce the uh, Art Roundtable, I want to invite two colleagues from Social Practice CUNY, uh, Greg Shillette and Catherine Lasota, who are going to share a little bit about what uh, Social Practice CUNY is um, and the call out for current um, applications for fellowships. So I'll welcome Catherine and Greg. Hey, thank you, Sarah, so much. Uh, Zara as well. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Real quick, because I know we, we're running low on time. Social Practice CUNY has been a, technically around for just a few years, but we have a longer history. It goes back to Queens College, about 15 years now. We give uh, stipends to fellows that are both faculty people and also students at the master's level and above. And it's people who are already interested and in working on uh, culture and, and social activism, culture and social justice. Those are sort of the areas that we, we look for the intersection of. We don't actually teach those things per se, but we provide support for it financially, but also with a couple of classes, one that I teach and one my colleague Chloe Bass teaches, one spring, one fall. And uh, yeah, I encourage you to take a look. You can simply Google spcuny.org, I think, right? And you get right to uh, Social practice, well, yeah. yeah. 
It's out there. It's out there. <laughs> Socialpracticecuny.org. So, and you can get in touch and we can ask questions. So. Yeah. And we're just, uh, uh, so we, every year we have, for the academic year, we offer fellowships to students and faculty, and we've just opened our call for applications for graduate student fellows, and just wanted to bring attention in case that's interesting to anybody. We have a, this flyer on the table outside. I also have them if you want to grab one from me um, about what we are, what our students do, and then um, we're also opening our call for faculty fellowships in May. Um, and there's information, there's a link to our website on here as well. Um, and it's, it's CUNY-wide, it's a really unique special opportunity to bring folks from all of the different campuses together who have these common interests and support each other in our social practice projects. Thanks. All right, thank you, Greg and Catherine. Um, as someone who comes from the arts um, and who's relationship to uh, social movement building and histories is really rooted in that work um, as both a student and as a cultural worker. I am so excited to introduce our last uh, conversation of the day focused on um, art making and movement building. Um, there are pronouns that have folks bios, so I'm just going to very briefly introduce our moderator and speaker, uh, speakers and then turn things over to uh, Real. Real Christian um, is a Hunter alum, so another uh, person in the CUNY uh, family. Um, she is a writer, editor, and art historian based in Queens, New York. Her work explores issues related to identity, diasporas, ecology, media, and materiality. Her essays, interviews, and criticism have appeared in Art in America, Art Forum, Bomb Magazine, The Brooklyn Rail, and art papers where she's a contributing editor. Uh, she is the Assistant Director of Editorial Initiatives at the Vera List Center for Art and Politics, a nonprofit research center based in the New School. Mark Lagany served 10 years in a Pennsylvania prison where he drew over 800 portraits of men with whom he was imprisoned. He was released in July of 2022. The portrait project called Ferric De uh, Defeat, a visual study of mass incarceration, debuted at MoMA PS1 in the award-winning exhibition, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. His work has been featured in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, Forbes, Art Forum, The Paris Review, Hyperallergic, NPR, galleries, dive bars, and museums. Alicia Grion uses performance and self-portrait, recomposing popular histories as a critique on politics of the present, an argument for the inclusion of marginalized communities in political and social spheres. She has participated in exhibitions in, at the Eighth Floor, Bronx Museum of Arts, Brick House of Arts and Media, El Museo de Barrio, and Columbia University. She currently has a solo exhibition on view at the Mead Art Museum at Amherst College, and she's a born and raised New Yorker. Betty Yu is an award-winning, socially engaged multimedia artist, photographer, filmmaker, and activist born and raised in New York City to Chinese immigrant parents. Betty's art emerges from collective struggle, and she places it in the service of building collective power. As a cultural worker, she remains deeply connected to grassroots organizing and has over 25 years of community, media justice, and labor organizing experience. She is a co-founder of Chinatown Art Brigade, a cultural collective using art to advance gentrification uh, organizing. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, there it is. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rial Christian. I um, just want to start by thanking um, the organizers of this symposium, um, and thank you to my friend Sarah Watson for inviting me um, to moderate this panel, and um, to the artists with me today for sharing your work with me and um, being in conversation. It's really an honor. Um, and I just want to start by asking the question that's sort of framing this program, um, what role do artists and cultural workers play in movement building and our understanding of movement histories? So I just want to keep that question in mind um, throughout this um, conversation and throughout the presentations. And uh, we're going to begin by um, each of you walking us through your recent works and um, sharing a little bit about your practices and um, sort of intersections with um, movement histories. And I think we're going to start with Mark. 
Hi, my name is Mark Lotney. Uh, I'm a formerly incarcerated artist. Uh, I'd just like to thank Sarah and Zara, Maddie, and uh, everyone at CUNY for the opportunity to be here today. Um, so I'm going to take you through a slideshow of uh, my work. Um, when I was in prison, I drew 800 portraits of the guys that I was in there with, and this is what it looked like at first. Uh, this was an arrangement of 96 portraits. I arranged them in the size of a prison cell, in the dimensions of a cell. Uh, this was the f um, this was shown in my hometown in Northeast Pennsylvania, and it was the response that I got from this show that encouraged me to continue to add to the project. Uh, initially, I didn't really have a direction for where this portrait project was going to go, or that it was even going to be a portrait project. At first, I was just drawing these portraits as a way to make commissary money and uh, for uh, my friends in prison to send images uh, or pictures of themselves home to their family and friends. Uh, but then I started to realize the power of uh, the collective voice that we all had. Uh, one day when I, I, I put them, I taped a few of them up in, in my cell and uh, just uh, I could feel the, 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 the power of it and um, thought it would be uh, worth the effort to show them. And this is what it looked like in the first iteration. And then from there, uh, I added to it and this was the second show that I did when the project was numbered at 250 portraits. And this was in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And it was here that uh, Jasmine Heiss from the Veer Institute of Justice came and gave her presentation in front of the portraits. And then uh, when she came back to New York, she told uh, people in the office of Veer and her friends at the Marshall Project about the, about the portrait project. And, um, an article was written by the Marshall Project, and uh, from there, doors started to open for the project, and I started to develop more of a direction for it. And it was right around this time that I read a book called The Rich Get Richer and the Poor Get Prison, and I started to realize uh, why the system worked the way that it did and what was driving mass incarceration. And uh, I learned about the clause in the 13th Amendment, and I thought, wow, there's really a connection here. Uh, to um, all these people that are in prison in America and uh, the extractive practice of uh, prison labor. And um, I felt that there was a really strong message to be talked about. So we continued to do shows and uh, who wrote Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration reached out to me to be part of her project. And uh, it was really um, a just a chain of fortuitous events that uh, I, I had no real control or input over. It was as if there was, uh, you know, this outside help that was um, aiding in the, the progress of the project. Uh, so this book came out in 2020, and it was accompanied by a traveling exhibition that debuted at MoMA PS1. And this is an image of, uh, of that show. And here's the interior of that room. This was 725 portraits. Um, and I didn't get to see this show because I was still in prison when it, uh, it debuted. But um, shortly after I was released, I got to see it at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Um, it was a really interesting experience because I was there as a spectator among other spectators in that room and I got to hear their thoughts and their feelings about the project. Uh, so it was uh, very eye-opening to me to be able to come home and to actually see and experience the feedback. Um, here's an individual portrait. These were done in 20-minute uh, to half-hour sittings in the day room in the prison, sometimes in the gym, sometimes in the yard. Here's another one. Uh, these are done in, in graphite and colored pencil. Um, when COVID ca came, uh, they locked us down and it, was, it pretty much shut down the portrait project because I, we didn't have access to each other. Uh, and then things started to slowly open back up and everybody had to come back out wearing masks. And uh, that really uh, helped with the, um, the uh, period of time that it took to draw the projects because I didn't have to focus so much 
on drawing the nose and the mouth. I could just draw the eyes. And it was important to us because uh, we weren't allowed to, to gather. It, we had to do like these surreptitious meetings and um, plan to, to get together. So the guys that sat for the project really stuck their necks out for it in an effort to be recognized and to have their agency reclaimed. And this is a, a photo of Dr. Nicole Fleetwood at the Schomburg Center where I drew her portrait. Um, she volunteered to sit for phase two of Pyrrhic Defeat, which uh, is going to consist of 800 portraits that I'm drawing of activists, uh, people who would like to show support for people incarcerated, people working in reform efforts. And uh, this is what I'm working on now. And my goal is 800 portraits. I'm at 160. So if anybody's interested in sitting for a portrait, it takes a half hour. I'd love to have you as part of that. Thank you. And I think, um, thank you, Mark. Um, I think next we're moving to Alicia, unless I'm misremembering the order. Hello. Hi, hi. It's nice to see so many people I haven't seen in quite a while in the audience, so thank you. Um, my name's Alicia, and um, Sarah um, let you know that I'm a lifelong New Yorker. That was going to be part of my introduction. <laughs> um, and my practice is largely based on, on, uh, on the image. I'm driven by the fact of, um, or by the power of what is signified in an image. I'm also a trained actor. So I went to school for a BFA for my acting and I, I left that for many different reasons, mostly the business itself. But these elements have come into my practice. This performative element and then the lens-based image making. And the what ties them together for me is going back to this idea of what is signified within an image. When I use myself, I, they're all self-portraits, I mostly use my own body because I'm largely aware of how I signify to whoever is in the room will vary, right? I'm a brown woman. How that falls on individuals will vary on what you know, what your experiences have been. So a lot of that uh, drives my work. And now I come to a point where I'm asking myself, well, what do I say to, to labor organizers and labor students about the work that I do? Um, particularly because art has this, this legacy and this history of, of being commodified and being objects of commo commodification. Um, objects of monetary exchange, objects that are seen in places that are not welcoming to all of us. Um, the image you see on the screen is my first reenactment. And reenactments have a tradition in art history. Maybe one of the most famous ones that might interest you is by Jeremy Dillard, uh, The Battle of Belgrave, where there were the reenactment of the coal miners fighting police officers in London during Thatcherism was redone a, a, a few decades after. So there's a tradition of reenacting live, current, historical events. This incident happened in 2007 where a Honduran man who was a migrant worker was found frozen to death near a, a Long Island railroad station. It was 2007 and the temperatures had dropped um, below three, Celsius, I'm not even using Fahrenheit because it was that cold. Um, this was a really fla a fast flash in the news um, and it struck me for many reasons. I am a child of immigrants, um, so the understanding of needing to leave your home um, varies with each person who leaves their home, but um, the sacrifices and the work and, and that narrative have always stayed with me, right? Um, having to work, um, 
working to survive, sending money back to family, supporting you know, cousins and everyone. Um, so that hit me more personally. And then I was shocked by the lack of, um, of, of any attention and the devaluization of this human being, who most likely is the same person who fixed your car, who brings your food, um, might do your lawn, um, might deliver your food. And for me, when from the next up projects that you'll look at where I am focusing on workers and labor, it has been a sense of renewing the humanity lost. I feel that many times when we're, we dis, the person who is doing the labor loses their humanity. They are only there for the sole function of providing whatever service it is that they're doing. And I've been meditating on that since 2007, since this incident. So it was reenacted near my home. I'm born and raised in the Bronx, Van Cortlandt Park, if you're familiar, Northwest Bronx, beautiful forest. Went into the forest um, and found a place that looked like it could work as shelter if I were to need shelter in the middle of the night, like this man. Um, unfortunately, today, if you Google, you know, Honduran man found frozen to death, you find my images, and that's not my intention. That was never my intention of the story. Um, you, if you're lucky, you may find the New York Times op-ed. In the same vein of this tradition, um, no cookies was done locally in um, 2010. In 2009, for a period of nine months, Stelladora workers protested outside of the Stelladora factory. If you're familiar with Stelladora cookies, you find they were in my neighborhood for over 80 years. The smell of cookies baking on Mondays and Wednesdays filled the neighborhood. They provided living wages, pensions, retirement for the workers, the majority from the immediate area. In the 90s, uh, Stelladora founders died, children sold company to Nabisco. Nabisco kept the uh, this similar, you know, sustainable, livable wages and um, benefits that Stelladora family had kept, so there was no problem. Come into the 2000s, Nabisco sells Stelladora to a Wall Street conglomerate, and this occurred in 2008, late 2008. Wall Street conglomerate starts cutting, off, cutting everything that um, made this job livable for, for people here in New York City. People struck. Um, the scabs came in and there were protests outside. Continuously rain, hail, snow, wind, heat, whatever it was. And the, the are you kidding? And the community that, um, that surrounded these strikers was immense. There was food, there was coffee, there was tea, there was like political education. So me pushing a stroller with two babies to the supermarket, I passed this and just continuously doc documented this. A year later, um, the judge judged in favor for the workers. Three months later, said Wall Street conglomerate moves Celadora to South Carolina. That area is now malls. So anyway, a year later, I, I reenacted this that I had witnessed for about um, a year. And former workers came up to me asking me, I can't believe someone took the time to even remember this. Um, others came to me um, not knowing whether this was still the strike. <laughs> and others came up just not knowing what happened. So a lot of it was a lot of information exchange while I was giving away cookies and holding up signs. The last piece of work I will, I'll, I'll talk and flip um, in the time that I have remaining are my essential workers portraits that I did over the pandemic. And um, each of these portraits, the date is the date on which I took it. 
and it is accompanied by a link and the title to an article that focuses on that essential worker. Um, I'll read a quick blurb that I wrote for Verso Books on, on about this series. Um, the first two months of the pandemic were filled with the sound of ambulance sirens 24 hours a day, seven days a week. At the beginning, I attempted to keep count of each siren I heard, but it simply got to be too many at a time, and I did not want to normalize any of it because the overall handling of the crisis had been abysmal. Another week in, I stopped looking at the time. COVID broke what was familiar to me, who I felt close to, fractured from anything recognizable for some time to come. Aside from immediate family living with me, the only other human beings I would see were essential workers. I began to measure time based on my interactions with them. Morning meant receiving the mail from the postal person. Afternoon came to mean seeing construction workers from outside my window, carefully walking on the scaffolding. I could tell from a distance that they were sick. Every step was extra cautious. If we were out of food, it meant a week had passed. I'd see the cashiers at the supermarket scared shitless, and we'd look at each other not knowing anymore how to say hello or how are you. So the first image of this series of 18 self-portraits was taken on March 31st, 2020, and it was of the, of the printer, prisoners at Rikers Island who were being forced to dig, dig graves for the people who had died. That to me it was the first essential worker that I decided to um, focus on. The second um, is the nurses, April 13th. These were all taken within my home, um, costumes put together. Um, this is not the third one, but it's taken on May 8th, and it's about our postal workers. Our MTA workers, one of the few people that I would see continuously on the street, you know, we would like wave. Um, so many, so many bus drivers. Um, and this last image is a sneak peek if you're ever in, in the Berkshires, I would recommend it. It's lovely this time of year. And you can also go see my exhibition and um, it's a slow, like a slow walk of, with trees. And it's been a long meditation and when I say meditation, it, it inquires a lot of, or requires a lot of research, reading and writing and distilling ideas and I've taken a long time meditating on land and labor. Um, what's occurred to the land due to the acts imposed on it due to our labor? What our greater purpose of whatever labor we do is? Um, and I hope you get a chance to see it. This is a detail of an object. It's a combination of text and photographs um, and video and, and some other elements within, within the room. Thank you. It, Sarah mentioned it earlier, but it's at the Mead Art Museum at Amherst College. When is it up until? It's up. It's up. <laughs> it's up. Use this one. <laughs> it's up until June 23rd, but there's like, it's closed for two weeks in May. Um, the museum is. Thank you. Uh, no. Oh, it does. Well, it doesn't matter. They turn it on back there. Yeah. When, when you pick it up. Oh. Hello? Okay. <laughs> They're like, does this thing work? Excuse me. Um, thank you. It's a hard, hard act to follow. Um, okay, uh, very good to see familiar faces out here um, as well. Thank you, Sarah and Maddie, for organizing this conference or inviting me here. Um, so I'm going to just start with black. Okay. Oh, there we go. Um, I'll just start by saying, yes, I was born and raised in New York City, specifically Sunset Park, born and raised, um, and still live in, uh, in Brooklyn. Um, I wanted to start, uh, although my, I myself am a socially engaged multimedia artist and educator and lifelong activist, I did want to start by talking about Chinatown Art Brigade, the collective 
um, I co-founded um, in 2015 with two other artists. And that's really to kind of um, bust the myth that artists are just navel gazers and individualistic and don't care about social justice issues. We don't care about you know, what's happening in the world today. Um, and I think that specifically as folks who um, happened to be born and raised in New York City when we founded Chinatown Art Brigade, um, we really had, have always centered the needs um, and stories of people who are most marginalized and most impacted by displacement and gentrification, um, in this case in Chinatown, right? Um, and so I just wanted to kind of start with um, the example of Chinatown Art Brigade. If there's time, I'll show some slides of some of my multimedia installation work. Um, but I wanted to start with the brigade. And just to also say, in terms of the connection to labor, um, <clears throat> so my parents are both garment workers. Um, you know, immigrants from Hong Kong and China. You know, I'm related, I found out about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, no, actually a few years ago, I found out that I had a great grandfather who actually came here to work probably on the railroads uh, in Nevada in the late 1800s. And I always knew I had a grandfather that came here and he was um, a leader in the, the hand laundry worker movement in, um, in New York. He was actually a co-founder of the Chinese hand um, la no, CHLA, Chinese Hand Laundry Alliance of New York. Not to conf confuse with another more kind of middle of the road group, they were much more of a communist organization. Um, but so I had many iterations of my family here, but because of the 1882 Exclusion Act, they actually couldn't stay or build roots here. So just to say it's kind of very complicated. But anyway, so um, this photo here is um, Chinatown Art Brigade members, and we're on, I don't know if there's captions on this one now. There, do we end up? Not in slideshow slide mode, okay. China, okay, so um, we are on the rooftop of a tenement building in Chinatown where um, some of the members of uh, CAV, Organizing Asian Communities, which is the group that we work very closely with, they have a Chinatown Tenants Union. And the Chinatown Tenants Union started a little bit after 9-11, so folks probably here know that after 9-11, um, everything changed in Lower East Side in Chinatown. Uh, although there was a lot of focus on World Trade Center specifically, um, you know, a lot of folks, obviously there's the health concerns, people dying of cancer, right, um, but also uh, people who lost their jobs, like my parents who were garment workers, uh, garments couldn't get in or out of Chinatown, and then eventually, as we know, all of these, all of that legislation that we see now pass for sort of around rezoning started really after 9-11, land grabs for real estate, the real estate industrial complex, and now all those factory buildings and all the all, all of that, what made Chinatown the lifeblood of Chinatown, a lot of it has been converted to galleries, commercial galleries, and office spaces. So all that to say that, you know, now we're sort of at the, probably at the latest stage of gentrification in Chinatown, where you have people who are just fighting to stay even in their tenement building, um, in their um, a, a, a apartment that's been cut up into like four or five, um, little rooms. So anyway, um, that's one of the members who've been, who's been organizing um, against the landlord um, on, on our rooftop. And that was a really special day because we really kind of bonded. We did a, we were doing, um, this is part of the same few months. Um, we actually did a, a two month long workshop series with uh, tenants of uh, the Chinatown Tenants Union as well as residents and activists who care deeply about Chinatown, have deep roots in Chinatown. This is in Manhattan. And one of the things we started with was really a story circle, right? Like really kind of starting with uh, Junebug Productions, for those of you who might know in the South, a tradition of story circles, that model um, has really influenced our work. And um, starting with that and sort of just being on a level playing field as artists who are from New York City, right? But in a very different economic situation than the the tenants that we're working with. And um, we decided uh, that we wanted to, first of all, I have to say that our curriculum that we presented, the tenants were like, no, that doesn't make any sense. They scrapped it, and I was like, yes, okay. Let's, let's start from ground, we started from scratch. And it was their idea eventually to do mapping and to do walks, as well as culminate it into these uh, pro light projections at night onto walls. And I'll just show you photos of that in a second. But this was a walk that we did over um, two weeks, and it was really special because we were able to, Mimi, who top right, um, 
photo, I won't show you the inside of, of her apartment. This is the apartment we're on the roof of, just because out of respect, but she, um, she was living with her mom in a small room and they were being evicted basically um, because the landlord wanted to turn the whole building into market rate uh, luxury housing. Um, on the bottom right, you could see we also, um, one of the tenants wanted to walk by um, where a concentration of the galleries are, commercial galleries, that have replaced mom and pop places. Um, that are, again, the lifeblood of Chinatown. People started chalking, writing messages. Where, you know, do you know what you replaced when you open your gallery? Do you know, like, uh, you know, Chinatown out for sale? Things like that. Um, and then on the bottom left, there was a garment worker who worked in a, uh, a tenant leader who worked as a garment worker for 20 years in a building. She lived around the corner from it. She said she would never walk by the block because it was too painful. And we were on that walk, and she literally said, wow, that is a luxury gym now. I can't believe it. And condos. So it really took her by surprise, actually, because she never walked by that block. So she's talking about that experience. And then top left is, um, again, some of these um, places that have been, um, you can't really see it, it's actually to the right, but they have, been, again, a place, a bakery that, w that has been replaced by a, um, a commercial gallery. Mapping is really important to us. Um, mapping in the sense of telling people stories, counter cartography, counter mapping um, is, is very key to our work. And so um, one of our members early on started mapping out the commercial galleries that have replaced the mom and pop places um, and we, at that time, was 110. And even with COVID, it's, it's, it's about that, if not higher, in Chinatown. Um, and we did this mapping project with members of the Tenants Union, where they basically talked about the places of resilience and resistance, basically places that are no longer there, um, but there was a lot of history behind it, like hotels uh, that were sites of the first unionized restaurants, the, the, the last movie theater in Chinatown, and the places that are still there that are still resilient and fighting, uh, went on rent strike or organized, um, the restaurants organized and unionized, things like that. So uh, they really kind of, uh, we really mapped out the full breadth of of Chinatown um, and its stories. And then um, we um, we decided to take this into a 2.0 <laughs> project and um, created an augmented reality experience. This was a show that we had uh, right across the street from City Hall at Pace University um, Gallery, Art Gallery. Um, oh yeah, the time does fly. Oh yeah, okay. I'm gonna try to wrap up really fast. Um, so, um, so basically, people could take that, use the app, a free app, and do their walk. We are currently dealing. Uh, currently, we're f we're going to create a broadsheet, like a newspaper, where people can take it with them, so they have directions of how to actually do the walk. But right, you know, so, but um. The idea is that you walk and then you trigger this image and, and this placekeeping story um, of, a, of a tenant comes up, of a worker um, comes up. Um, so it's really uh, very powerful. Another aspect of our work has been creating uh, know your rights or know your tenant rights videos with tenants. Tenants are the ones leading the way, right, in terms of knowing what the experiences are in housing court. So they were the ones that suggested this. Like we want this as a way to share it with our peers. Like this is what you expect. This is kind of the tip the loophole, you know, all that, loopholes and things like that. Um, and this um, was, is, is still playing on screens at the cab office where people who would come in during intake, during clinic days, um, housing clinic days, this is the first thing they're greeted with is seeing um, these videos. Um, and then um, I'll end on some of the organizing around uh, abolition organizing, fighting the new jail that is uh, being built in Chinatown. We all know there's the tombs, which has been there for over 100 years. They want to tear that down and build a 40-story um, jail that takes up three, four city blocks. It's going to be the tallest jail in, um, in the world. Um, and we've been organizing against it, holding cultural institutions in our own community, who uh, like the Museum of Chinese in America that had radical roots, sadly, 40 years forward now. They, um, received 30, they took $35 million from the city for their blessing, in return for their blessing for the jail. That's going to be built around the corner from them. And so we are using this as a way to really talk about abolition and, and what is it that keeps us face, safe. And what is um, policing has always actually even hurt right the Asian American community and bringing and drawing on the Black and Asian solidarity the history of that solidarity that has been around for a long time. So I'll end with um, I'm sorry I had projection images I don't know what happened to them but sorry 
that might be my bad. Um, this is some work that I did, I, I worked on um, two, three years ago, and this is a Queens Museum, it's called uh, Resistance in Progress, and it's a multimedia project focusing on working with um, organizers on the ground in Flushing, um, that have been fighting the waterfront, uh, regen uh, the gentrification at the waterfront um, for the last six years. Um, and, and in particular, um, this neighborhood has seen um, gentrification and construction uh, go up by a thousand percent in just a very short amount of time. And so um, collaging of like a, the pr average price of a condo is like a million dollars for a one bedroom. Just, you know, just crazy, crazy kind of um, thinking about, you know, how, how your average like South Asian, Korean, or Chinese immigrants are actually going to survive. Um, so really centering the people's people stories in the neighborhood that it's in. Um, Sunset Park, similar, displaced in Sunset Park, is an AR and a placekeeping and a mapping story project where um, I interviewed about 20 folks in Chinatown and in, in the Latinx and the Chinatown part um, and looking at how gentr what gentrification looks like. On the Latin at Latinx side, it's it's more industry city. And in the Chinatown side, it's much more insidious because there's um, people that look like me but don't have the interest of people like me or my parents in mind. Um, so it's people that look like me, right? So it's really economics, right, uh, at, at the bottom of it all. I mean, at the, you know, sort of at, at the crux of it. And then this last project was really um, several years ago looking at um, the rise of anti-Asian violence and its roots that go back obviously to the to policies like the 1882 Exclusion Act, like internment camps of, of Japanese during World War II. But more importantly, I wanted to really draw on, um, again, black and Asian solidarity and really um, challenge the dominant narrative that Asian Americans want more police in our streets to keep us safe, and that um, actually many people don't want that uh, for many different reasons. And so this was a chance to talk to people in neighborhoods and collect their stories and project them onto walls at night. And I apologize, the one image I, I thought I had in there was our projections in Chinatown where we projected people's stories, tenant stories, but um, you can find that online um, on our website. Um, and th we did a few of those, and that was really beautiful. That was a culmination of our workshops where people told their stories, and then we used that as an organizing moment where tenant organizers talked to people on the street about what was, what was happening and, and, and actually using that as a way to um, draw attention to the organizing um, of tenants who are fighting back. So um, I'll stop there. Sorry. Um, thank you, Betty, um, and thank you, all of you. Um, I, my first question, I want to kind of pick up on something you've all sort of spoken to. Um, the fact that um, art, um, in sort of the commercial art world, um, the ways in which artistic practices are used as a commodity and are often used to co-opt um, politically and socially engaged issues. Um, and I'm wondering how each of you sort of grapple with the fact that um, art or artist-led gentrification is often um, one of the things that is um, that you're sort of centering in your practices. Um, how do you navigate the field with that with that knowledge? It's something I deal with too as a as a writer. Um, yeah, and maybe I can start with Betty. Um. I mean, I think that um, when Chinatown Art Brigade first started, um, we had the ear of a lot of folks. I think it was right after Trump was elected, and um, our comrades at Decolonize This Place, who I love dearly, um, had a residency at Artist Space, uh, which was, they were on Walker Street at the time. And um, we had been collaborating, and they're like, what if you did a town hall meeting and invited these gentrifying artists um, and galleries um, to this town hall, and you really put a pledge out, and you and, and you put a call out, right, like a call to action, and we we held it. And again, I think there was a lot of white guilt, or just guilt in general, with Trump and all this stuff. So you had all these like white gallerists coming, and artists, which is cool. We had like over 300 and change people. If you know that space, it's really tiny. So there were people spilling out into the street. It was kind of crazy. We were not expecting that. Um, but what did come out of it was, you know, um, a group, uh, Art Against Displacement, um, which you should all look up if you don't know about them. They're an amazing group. They sort of started, it started out as a few um, non-commercial gallery um, owners that, that started the group. 
that really, really wanted to, to figure out how they could be allies. But the nature of the capitalist system is that a lot of them end up dropping out, even the non-commercial ones, and especially even the commercial ones who have best intentions because they're, it goes against their interests, right, to like challenge everything they're about. And so now it's really mainly artists. But all that to say that what we've learned along the way really is that artists um, and these gallerists and all the amenities that they bring, the bars and the clubs and, you know, Dime Square. I don't know if folks have heard Dime Square in Chinatown that got coined, um, uh, you know, because of all the, all the, I guess, I don't know, like TikTok or like all the models kind of doing selfies there and wearing Gucci and Chanel or something. I don't even know. But Dime Square. <laughs> um, so what we have realized throughout this process is really that the real estate developers know exactly how to pit long-term residents against um, artists, artists who maybe some of them are struggling, but some of them not, right? The creative class. So that is just time over time, time and time again. If you look at a lot of neighbors across the country, this is the same formula. So we have really shifted our, our focus on holding the government accountable, holding, holding the city, account, city government accountable, because they're the ones that are giving these zoning, um, passing these zoning laws, right, uh, allowing these developers to build condos, right, and then knowing that in order to sort of get the people to um, to raise the real estate values, right, you have to get the artist in, you have to get the galleries in, and those folks look at Soho, right? Like those folks, maybe they last five, six years, and then they get priced out. So they're Trojan horses. So all the pop-up spaces, all all of that is very um, sort of temporary, right? Um, and so, you know, not that we want to win them over, right, these folks who are individual gentrifiers or commercial galleries, but it's to say, you know what, you also have a stake in this too, right? Not as, as deeply as people most directly impacted, um, but we came out with a pledge, um, uh, and you can find that online, which wasn't just about individual, it wasn't just about, oh, this individual gallery should you know, um, show artists of color uh, or translate your work, but it was really about how are you going to be a real ally and get involved in this organizing? And there's um, a, a leg there's a, a community-led uh, uh, rezoning plan called the Chinatown Working Group Plan, which would, would the, the community came up with that, and it's been 10 years now, and it's about getting that passed that would really get the city to protect Chinatown and the Lower East Side. Um, and so in that pledge, we, we had all these recommendations, and we were getting calls from people all around the world. Then we found ourselves being like the artist police. People would call the, us and say, hey, do you think it's cool to show in this place or that place? And I'm like, this is not what we want to be doing at all. So it took a long time to get us to the place where we're like, sure, you guys should organize yourselves. Yes, we are artists, but we're actually working with the tenants, and we're actually, that is where our, our, our allegiance, allegiance is, is working with tenants to amplify their stories of resistance. Um, and so it's been really a, still a very weird place to be where we have found ourselves to be the art police. It's very strange. Um, anyway, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, and then I have another question, but um, Mark and Alicia, if you have a response to that, that last question too, I'd love to hear. But um, they're also, within the art world, they're all of these um, sort of overlapping forms of labor, labor um, because the creative practice is not um, enough to sustain us. Um, so um, the idea of an art worker, um, you know, emerged in the in the '60s. Art Workers Coalition, Black Emergency Cultural Coalition, um, a lot of the union organizing at MoMA um, and other museums that kind of followed in the wake. Um, how do the um, each of you sort of, or we kind of heard this and Sarah reading each of your bios? How did these overlapping forms of labor inform your practices? Um, do they intersect? Do you see them as distinct? Um, how do you? sort of hold space for the, the creative agency you have as artists as opposed to um, sort of the work you do maybe with, within, or adjacent to institutions? I'll try. <laughs> I'll try to repeat it. Um, how do you see uh, the overlapping forms of labor um, within your lives, within your work, kind of influencing your creative practices? Overlapping types of labor. 
um, I'm a parent. I'm a single parent. All that labor at home, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. That's an o certainly an overlap. Organizing, whether it's supporting comrades like the ones that Betty mentioned, and in addition, in the past, Betty, this is all pre pandemic. Um, I mean, that's an overlapping labor. Why do I organize? Why do I choose to do organizing work? Um, it's because for me, the it's what I have to do to keep my own dignity in this world. Um, I am born and raised in New York City. My parents immigrated here. They did. They were not. They were escaping uh, political, extra, you know, shit. Um, the U.S. had invaded their country the year after the assassination of a brutal dictator. You know, um, there's a sense of responsibility for me to be present in my community, in however my community, and I, we all belong to many different communities. That's another thing. Um, so for me, it's I guess it's I don't see them overlapping because it all it all all just exists for me. Like I'm, I'm an artist, that's what, that's what I do. So I use the skills that I have to try to make a dent because I don't like the way that the world is moving. And this is the 21st century, it is 2024, and we're repeating the constant bullshit, you know, generation after generation. And I, I'm, I'm tired, I'm sincerely like just physically tired. So what do I do? I can't fold, so I have to focus. So I use these, these tools, you know. Because my parents are immigrants, you know, I'm Dominican. So Washington Heights, you know, last century, I'm a half century year old, you know, years old. So, you know, immigrant communities, you had to organize. It was all through community. You know, if it was fighting for language rights, you know, there, I have these memories of people filling the living room in my house. And I'm like, why are all these people here? My parents were organizing because there wasn't enough like interpretation or language and they were hella Catholic. So a lot of it, you know, a lot of the organizing took place at church or with church folks at my house, you know, but it, it even if it was just food justice, you know, how do we get better f food in, in our vicinity? Um, so for me, it was just, it, this is what I do because I live on this planet. Um, and these are the choices because I want to find more purpose in, in what I do. There must be more purpose in what we do. Even if we look at the bees and the and beavers, there's a purpose to their labor. Um, and that's a question that I've been meditating on for, for quite a while. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. I would be full of baloney if I pretended that I knew how to answer that uh, because I'm, I'm fairly new to my practice uh, in, in this capacity. Um, I do know that I, um, I have um, this body of work which is very meaningful, that I, f I feel is very meaningful and that I need or that I feel really compelled to add to and to keep working on and to uh, bring a message to people who may not be aware of what's going on. Um, so I've had, I've had some very uh, substantial support for that project. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for, for all of that. Uh, in a separate body of work, I, I paint pretty pictures that I can make some hamburger money with. So then there's that commercial aspect. I'm not represented by a gallery. I, I've never had a, a commercial gallery show. So I'm still learning how that intersection works out. Uh, but I feel like the most important thing that I have going on in my life right now is uh, bringing a message um, and adding to the portrait project in a way that uh, continues to bring awareness of the issues that we're talking about today and ultimately to propel legislative momentum that will change the things that we're talking about. So to 
speaking of overlapping types of labor, and thank you for talking about the labor that's never acknowledged by mothers, by parents. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a new parent, I have a two-year-old, um, and I have to say that um, that level of guilt that you have, but also the level of um, internalized capitalist values of like being productive all the time. Um, so it's the guilt that I'm not with my kid all the time, but also this feeling that as an artist or as a uh, uh, adjunct professor and all these hats that I wear that I have to do all of them, right? Like all the time and not decrease it because um, having a child, we just were talking, I mean, it's beyond, I mean, the amount of respect I have. I've always had that respect, but it's just beyond what words can express in terms of uh, parenting. Um, and um, I feel like people who do domestic labor, right? I mean, we're just not compensated for it folks who are caretakers. Um, folks might know about um, what's happening with um, home health care workers who were actually on hunger strike the week before last. Uh, they were on hunger strike for a week and then they're picking it up again on May 1st. Um, they're actually protesting the 24-7 uh, uh, workday um, where uh, basically they are only paid for eight hours but they're expected to be there for 24 hours living with the person they're taking care of um, and it's completely inhumane and most of the folks who were um, hunger striking were women of color, immigrant women, um, but I also think about my own mom who was a garment worker who um, basically you know, worked 13 hours a day in a garment factory and came home because my dad was my dad, my mom would do all the housework and cook and, and all of that and had to be super mom. And so I really think about that labor, that invisible labor that is just not recognized. So a plug for actually a show that I'm a part of at Old Stone House in um, Park Slope. And the whole show is about actually women's work, um, particularly moms and mother's work um, and caretakers work that is, is not acknowledged. So it's about a, ut a utopian care economy and what that would look like. So that's at Old Stone House. That's up, I think, until May. So I have some work that I uh, did with uh, the National Domestic Workers Alliance where I interviewed some domestic workers, some nannies, um, about their work um, that's in there. But I just want to say that, um, you know, like labor, it looks, it, it looks like it shows up in many, many different ways. Um, and what does it look like? You know, folks are talking about what, how, what, it look, what does it look like when we with, oh, withhold our labor, right, during general strikes, right? Um, what does that look like? And I think that, um, you know, the, the, you know, especially uh, some 10 years ago when, you know, immigrant workers were going on strike and withholding their labor. Day, I mean, I hate that day, day without an immigrant. It just sounds so weird. But, you know, really the impact of that, that in mass, what does that look like in the absence of, our work, we're withholding our labor for Palestine, for what's gonna happening in Gaza. And I think that, um, that I know goes into another discussion, but, uh, but the absence of it too is, is it can be very, very powerful um, when millions of people do that. <laughs> and sadly, this country is um, not really that powerful when it comes to general strikes um, like other places, but anyway. We're only valued for what we produce. When we stop producing, we're no longer valued. Case in point, cis women after a certain age. Mm -hmm. Like that, just, just one part of our society and how that extends further into, into labor, into our work, um, you know, is not surprising. You know, even older people, they're just not valued. You're, you can't produce anymore, go, we're gonna send you somewhere. And, we don't want to see you anymore. Um, so I guess, yeah, it's a lot of rehumanizing of, of ourselves and our own value outside of what it is that we're producing. And if we're producing something, like, you know, it's great to talk to a group of people who are doing this because they love what they do and they, but we cross the street to an office worker. Why are you an office worker? I have this and this and this to pay, and I have this and this, and I want this and this and this. But what's that greater purpose? for the work and the energy we're putting in to this planet. Um, yeah, as you were um, both speaking, I was thinking about, um, well, Sylvia, Sylvia Federici talks about um, sort of framing labor within the organization of wages for housework uh, around the idea of reproduction. So um, the ways that um, mothers in particular um, but also kind of um, looking at 
people who work within domestic spaces, how that form of labor is undervalued, but how we can't really have a, a fair conversation about labor until those forms of labor become more visible and become more um, recognized. And, and when you brought up Sylvia, you know, it's our, our whole, the whole chattel slavery system here in the United States. It's like we're in the Western Hemisphere, excuse me, in the Western Hemisphere. You know, working someone until they died, no, no, you're no longer valuable. Okay, next. And, and how do we break that cycle? Um, is, is our next task, because I think that in that we'll find a lot of solutions to, to the problems in our world, and we can name so many right now. Um, Mark, I had a question about the, um, about your portrait project. Um, I, I'm trying to remember when I saw it at PS1 whether or not each of the portraits are um, titled or named after the sitters or is there kind of um, a, a, sort, a kind of anonymity um, to the people sitting and is that kind of part of the project? Yes, uh, there's no names that are attached to the individual portraits. Um, I know most of the gentlemen who sat for me personally, and I have a list of their names, um, but I, I, uh, I wanted to make it anonymous to protect them, and um, I felt that um, it, was, it was more so about the collective of, of us all. And uh, although there are very interesting and meaningful and important individual stories that are going on, and um, responses uh, as a viewer that you'll experience. Uh, the gran it's the grander picture that we all came together for to achieve that, that experience. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think the idea of, of um, the idea of the collective within collaborative modes of art making is um, also something that you've all talked about. Um, and I think in the in the US, it seems, the idea of an artist collective is not necessarily as prevalent. Um, and they tend to come out of um, situations of precarity. And you see more artist collectives um, in places, um, thinking of Good School in um, Indonesia, where it's a collective of collectives. It's, there are so many collectives. They needed a collective to kind of organize it all. Um, and so. I'm wondering if you could, um, I mean, you've all sort of spoken to this, but um, yeah, kind of how the idea of collective work um, sort of informs your organizing. Um. Well, I, I would say for me and us, I could safely say that um, we are just part of a continuum, right? And understanding that this work is not gonna end with us and we're not gonna, um, and it's, it, I mean, it's definitely not gonna end with us and that we're laying down the groundwork for future generations to continue this work. And I don't mean in an abstract way, but I mean in a very concrete way, how do we leave these tools, whether they're cultural organizing tools, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, literally like a toolkit or, 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 or sort of kind of uh, a manifesto, if you can, <laughs> if you will, um, of, of approaches that how can, you know, um, I think that taking the ego out of the artist is very important for me. Uh, I think we all have egos, obviously, right? But when we're working in a collective and being inspired by not only other artist collectives, but movements, um, you, know, uh, you know, it humbles you, right? And to understand that this work has been going on for centuries, you know, this resistance work and even cultural organizing. Yes, now it's called so socially engaged, you know, art, right? But it's been around for a long time. People have been just the nature of human beings. We are engaged with each other. We are participatory. We're gonna do this work, right, in some way in relationship to each other. So kind of understanding that, and um, you know, I keep going back to just uh, the work of Emery Douglas as the Minister of Culture um, in the Black Panther Party. Very, as a teenager, even before I, you know, I kind of knew I wanted to study photography and film, but wasn't really, I kind of was involved in Chinatown organizing in high school, but not really. 
a little bit, um, but very, very inspired by that work and um, the idea of the, the visual language that was commonplace at that time, right? That he, you know, he and other folks coined the pig as a police officer, you know, the money bags, you know, as the capitalist, right? There are certain things that we now don't need any words. There's that, just that visual that we understand what that is and the power of the graphic, right? Um, and because he was appealing to folks mostly who were um, uh, illiterate, right, and had different forms of knowledge, that, but not um, an academic one, but uh, other kinds of, 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 of experience. And him really j just kind of understanding that and having a pulse on the sense of where people were at. And I think that uh, ultimately for me, um, learning from other collectives like Basement Workshop, which is a, um, a collective um, from the 1970s in Chinatown where uh, uh, my comrade Tamia Arai, who um, is a co-founder with me of Chinatown Art Brigade, who was also a founder of Basement Workshop. Um, at that time, they were like wanted, they were so inspired by the Black Liberation Movement and by what was happening throughout the country, and they were like, how can we put our ser so ourselves in service of what's happening in Chinatown, even in the 70s, and so they came from all walks of life and a lot of them dropped out of school and started to just organize, like whether it was through art and culture or just be involved in organizing. And so I'm very inspired by, by movements from that time period, actually. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your questions, but all that to say that for me, it's really decentering us as a, uh, as a, as a, as a collective. Like I, 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 I have mad respect for collectives who are able to function, not as like nonprofits, right? Not as like a 501c3, but collectives who are horizontal, in, in decision making and you know screw you know I mean I we work with nonprofits for sure but we're very specifically not one we were consciously everyone asked us uh, like the last 10 years um, you should become a nonprofit right we're like no that's not the point so it's not the point it's not that we want to work ourselves out of a job it's not like we want to become people who are on salary and that's fine if you are but that's not our purpose and so really to de to decenter us as artists, but we're kind of use, using ourselves as kind of vessels in a way. Um, also having agency, but it's, it's really about how do we kind of uh, create a new kind of uh, working class art and culture that is really truly working with people who are directly affected. So demystifying the cultural production aspect with folks who normally wouldn't have access to these tools is just as important um, to us. Um, it's, it's really vital that co-authorship, that co-ownership is, is really central to, to our work. I'm just gonna piggyback off after something you said um, just now. Um, and it's the, that value of what we place value on um, in regards to art and why you're creating it. You're not, it's very selfless what you're doing. Um, and the only thing I can add to that is a quote that my partner keeps telling me um, and he learned it from somewhere, the origin I do not know. But it's alone, you can go farther, but together we go further. Um, and I think as we are debunking our own individualistic ways of being, um, you know, my backyard, what can I get? I think that we are moving, we're social animals and we've because of this economic system, we've forgotten how to, how to work with others without needing to take them down because we want that. That's not, it's not a healthy work environment to be in and all of us probably have tons of stories of environments that we have all been in that are like that. And to deny its effect on society, to deny its effect on these landlords and, and how it is, is, it's pushing our city to a place that's just unrecognizable to me. Um, it's just not the loss of, of it's, it's the loss of, of New York City, you know. It's, this is the suburbanization of my, of my city, and I'm gonna say that, um, and I don't like that. Um, because the suburbs were meant to segregate. They were meant to keep apart. Um, they were meant to stratify. Um, that's all I have to say on collective work. I'm re-entering re collective work artistically since leaving theater um, 
and working on my own. So most of my collective work has been through organizing, either through the People's Cor Cultural Plan or through a mutual aid group that we formed called the North Bronx Collective. Um, that work, that collective work, um, has, has just reignited my wanting to work with people artistically. That's at the end. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience or from the chat? Oh. Um, I was so moved by all of your art. Um, I could just stand here and stare at it and you know have it just overwhelm me. Um, Mark, I wanted to ask you, because I know how I am with people, <laughs> um, what an intense situation to be creating your art in. Um, I'm just wondering about any kind of um, feeling of responsibility, like, oh, I promise I'll get this picture of you shown someplace else, or I promise I'll share it. You know, like, I mean, just a connection back to the people who sat for you. It gets pretty intense when people are sitting for you. and. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to talk about that. Thank you for, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I, I feel a huge responsibility to um, provide visibility for these gentlemen and for all the people who are incarcerated through those portraits of those gentlemen. Uh, um, you know, that's why they signed up to sit for that half hour. That's why they took the risk to meet me in the gym when we weren't supposed to do it. You know, they'd stuck their neck out so um, it's, uh, it's an honor to have that responsibility. And um, I'm, I'm gonna continue doing it. So thank you for that. Um, I was struck by so many things that you all said, so I feel a little overwhelmed. But it's something that I was thinking about for each of you as you talked about the ways that engagement with others through your practice um, changed you. And I was thinking about the, the tenants who were saying, actually, we got to throw this curriculum out, or this is how we want to do this, or the workers who came to you and said, you know, wait, what's going on here? How, like, why are you doing this? And, and, and for you, Mark, was thinking about the um, uh, like you said, when, when the prison locked down because of COVID, that people were willing to risk. And I was just curious if, um, if any of you could comment a little more on how people, people being a part of your practice has changed you. It's not complete without people. I'm not doing this for myself. I would just put it under my bed, but I'm you know, I, I want to talk to other people. I need to communicate. This is one form in, in which I communicate. So, um, and through that communication, then I get to listen to them, and that's where the learning starts. For me, um, um, through the portrait project, I was able to meet and talk to and um, learn about so many of these people that I wouldn't have uh, probably otherwise been able to make that connection with. And through those discussions, my empathy began to grow and my understanding of other people's situations and um, there was a real connection that happened by doing that. Oops, I would ditto what folks have said already, but um, I think that it, um, you know, it seems so um, obvious, but you know, when you're doing work in the past, I was involved with uh, doing, I was doing labor organizing in, in Chinatown, and now as a cultural collective supporting tenant um, organizing. Um, but you know, when you're working with folks, right, um, you know, you just see that, I mean, there are folks who obviously had different lives back home, right? Completely different lives. Um, you know, whether they were, you know, maybe on the higher, you know, higher upper echelons of society 
or also um, a migrant worker where they were, or working, you know, uh, manual labor jobs. But every single person um, has a story to tell, and every single person has a creative approach and a way to tell their story, right? So it wasn't like, you know, um, you know, for us, it's never like, oh, we're gonna hold your hand through it all. Whether it was like a video or like, how do you want? you know, your story to be, be portrayed on a projection slide, right? Uh, we work with them uh, over a period of two weeks to create their, their stories that were project projected on these walls at night. Um, and they all had a vision. Um, and a lot of them are writers, they're poets. Um, you know, uh, some of them are opera singers. You know, one of the uh, lead members of the Chinatown Tenants Union is, a f is part of a Fuchinese opera club, um, an amazing storyteller. Um, uh, through op through Chinese opera and, uh, and, and a calligraphy artist, I mean all kinds of things. So just to say that you know, um, you know, it really kind of puts you in your place, right? As someone who's like, well, actually, I'm learning a lot more from them, to be real. Um, and you know, maybe they're learning a few things from me, but I have learned a lot from them in terms of just uh, storytelling, right? In terms of just like s the social practice of all these things um, and um, the different iterations that we are um, we are sort of uh, approaching this work and, and each time it changes and it morphs and that's the beauty of it and the excitement of it is because it's not fixed because you're dealing with people um, and um, that is the the sort of active I don't know what you were you were saying something about like humans are we're sort of just like we're just it's all active organism it's just it's all social organism. social social uh, yeah I mean social. Just, I know it sounds so bizarro and corny, but I mean, just meaning that what excites me as an artist is that I'm constantly working with people, constantly creating situations for, t for participation. And that's what excites me. I, um, like you were saying, like, I, c I couldn't just be someone who's just in my own head um, all the time. And that, that's, that's not who I am. So um, I'm constantly learning um, and it's constantly changing and improving my practice, I guess, or our practice as a collective as well. I think that's, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think that's a good place to end. Um, and yeah, thank you. Um, thank, thanks all of you. Um, if you have any closing remarks or also just chat after yeah okay <laughs> thank you thank you 